Hello, and welcome to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Before we begin, please hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to support me. I'm still promoting my podcasts. I have two. This one is Dining with Death. This is an archival series. I don't make new episodes of this one, but it is on Apple and Spotify. It is the audio taken from the YouTube videos. This is the current podcast. I post new episodes every Monday and Wednesday for Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee, and there will be some podcast exclusive stories here, stories you can't hear anywhere else. You can also join my Patreon for a few dollars a month. You help me keep the videos coming, and you can also be part of our fundraiser. I will talk about that at the end of the video. I'm still here in my little temporary filming area as you can see I think the studio will be done in the next couple of weeks I thought it was going to be done last time my husband was home but you know how construction goes nothing ever goes the way that it's supposed to we had an electrical issue we're having to run electrical all through the yard to get to the backyard studio so I'm gonna be here in this little area for a couple more weeks thank you for being patient about it and thank you for being so cool about it you guys have been the best Today I have for you a very strange, dark story. This is one of those stories that makes you think, what happens to someone? What goes on in their mind? What childhood trauma or what personality problem makes them do the things that they do? Many of us have difficult upbringings. Many of us are victims of child abuse. Many of us have personality disorders. But we don't all go on to do the things that this person did in the story today. The actions of this person are so heartless, taking the greatest tragedy that can befall anyone, the loss of a child, and trying to benefit from it. That's exactly what this very strange man did. This is the story of Frederick Bourdin, the chameleon. I'm your host, Stacey Lee. Let's begin. Frédéric Pierre Bourdin is born in Nanterre, France, which is a suburb of Paris. He never knew who his father is. His mother told him once that his biological father was a man named Casey from Algeria. Frederick was raised by his grandparents. We don't have a lot of information on his upbringing, but right off the bat, we've got a fatherless kid and a mother who doesn't appear to be very involved if the grandparents are raising him, right? As a teenager, Frederick ran away from home and began living in downtown Paris. He got by on his wits. He is apparently very manipulative and very cunning. He made his way a lot of the time by using other people. Frederick was 20 years old when something happened a world away that would change his life forever. Across the ocean, here in America, San Antonio, Texas to be exact, lived a young boy named Nicholas Barclay. It's now 1994 and Nicholas was 13 years old at the time. Nicholas was born in Salt Lake City, Utah on New Year's Eve of 1980. Now living in Texas, Nicholas was struggling. He wasn't doing well at school. He was getting into all kinds of trouble at home. His mom was regularly calling the authorities on him. He was mouthy with his mom. He fought with his siblings, but it wasn't all Nicholas's fault. This was not a healthy home. Nicholas had two older half siblings, a brother named Jason and a sister named Carrie. Nicholas was the type of kid where sometimes he would run away and not come home for a day or two. Like I say, he wasn't a good student. He was in trouble all the time, but there are reasons for this. Nicholas's mother and his older brother, Jason, were drug addicts. Jason was known to have a very serious drug problem and he was often violent when he was high. So the household atmosphere was very unhealthy and it was very stressful. Neighbors report there was always yelling and screaming coming from the house. And so it's no surprise that Nicholas wasn't doing well in school. And it's no surprise that he ran away a lot. I mean, what kid would want to live with that? At just 13 years old, Nicholas already had a pretty extensive juvenile record. He'd been diagnosed with ADD and CPS was called regularly to come to the house. Teachers at Nicholas's school actually called CPS multiple times because they knew Nicholas was being neglected and sometimes abused. Now, I don't even know how this happens, especially back in 1994 when tattoo parlors weren't as prevalent as they are now, but Nicholas at 13 years old already had three tattoos. I mean, the little town I grew up in didn't even have a tattoo shop. 
And this is San Antonio, Texas. It's not Houston, but somehow he was able to get tattoos. There's a date in this story that you can either see as coincidence or you can see as very, very important. On June 14th, 1994, Nicholas was supposed to attend court. And at that court hearing, the judge was going to decide whether or not he would be placed in a group home, taken out of his family home, removed from the home and placed in a group home. Well, Nicholas would never make it to that court date. On June 13th, 1994, Nicholas was out playing basketball with a group of friends. Nicholas's mother had given him $5 and told him to be home by dinner. It was a beautiful summer night. Nicholas was taking full advantage of his summer break. He would stay out as late as possible with his friends. The boys played basketball until well after dark, well past dinner time, and then they started to go their separate ways to go home. On this particular night, Nicholas used a payphone to call his house and ask if someone could come and pick him up, give him a ride home. His older half-brother, Jason, picked up the phone and said, Mom's already asleep. You just need to walk home. It was a mile and a half. I just, I, I, things were different back then. I wouldn't let my granddaughters walk a block. A mile and a half after dark, that is crazy. I know there are people that still don't care about their kids. I lose my mind every time I drive to the grocery store, there's like a little gas station by the grocery store and I see kids on this busy intersection, seven, eight-year-old kids on scooters, like going into the gas station to get treats and stuff. I. I don't know, I, I said this before, I guess I'm a Karen because it drives me crazy. I am not sending an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, even a 10-year-old to the gas station by themselves. My parents used to drop us off at the roller skating rink with $5 and come back in like three hours. I would no sooner do that with my grandkids now. The thought of that just sends a chill down my spine, but it was totally normal back then. So this poor kid, Nicholas, is left to walk a mile and a half home in the dark by himself. He hangs up the payphone, resigns himself to the fact that he's got to walk, and he starts on the long journey. Nicholas disappears into the night, and he is never seen again. When Nicholas does not return home that night, nobody does anything. That's how dysfunctional this family was. They didn't even report this kid missing for three days. This is a 13-year-old child who was left to walk a mile and a half home in the dark by himself, and no one reported him missing for three days. It's, it's appalling. When the family does decide to report Nicholas missing and the call comes into the police and the police hear that it's Nicholas Barclay that's gone missing, they don't even bother to do anything. This police department is accustomed to getting calls about Nicholas Barclay and the other people in his family. Getting a call that Nicholas had run away again or was missing again, that was a Tuesday. The cops were well aware that this was a house of domestic violence. It was a house where there were drug users. It was a house where there was all kinds of problems all the time. This boy going missing was such a non-issue that it didn't even make the news. Nicholas Barclay did not even warrant a blip on the radar in the newspaper or on the nightly news. I think it's awful and I think it's really sad that we pick and choose which kids matter. If this was a pretty little girl from a rich neighborhood, it would be all over the news. We all know that's true. But finally, some information is in fact put out about Nicholas being missing. Nicholas was last seen wearing a white shirt, purple pants, and he was carrying a pink backpack. Nicholas's mother told the police that yes, she thought her son would get into a car with strangers if it meant not having to walk home. But knowing that about her son was not important enough for her to go and pick him up. The police did eventually start to look for Nicholas. They looked for him for a week and then a month and then three months. In September of 1994, Nicholas's older brother, Jason, called the police to tell them that he was looking out the window and he saw Nicholas in the backyard trying to break into the garage. Jason tells the police that when Nicholas saw Jason watching him, he ran away. The police arrive at the home, they canvass the area, they can find absolutely no proof that Nicholas was ever there. Now, the police find this entire event very suspicious because there are rumors circulating that Jason is responsible for Nicholas's disappearance. There are a lot of people that think Jason hurt Nicholas or did something to him. So when Jason calls to report this sighting, it feels a little bit like he's trying to cover his tracks. He's trying to prove that Nicholas is still alive. 
people in the area didn't really believe that Nicholas showed up back at his house because they thought Nicholas was dead. Nicholas's brother Jason would later die of a drug overdose. Months turned into a year, and then a year turned into three years. Nicholas Barclay was nowhere to be found. And then the family got a phone call. A call comes in to Nicholas Barclay's mother. On the other end of the line is a detective calling from Spain. Nicholas's mother gets the police involved and soon the police are talking with this detective in Spain. At first they thought, what on earth would somebody be calling San Antonio, Texas from Spain for? But the detective on the other end of the line tells them, he has a young man in a youth shelter claiming to be 16 year old Nicholas Barclay. The cop cannot believe his ears. Everyone in this area knows the name Nicholas Barclay. Everyone knows there is a missing kid. He was 13 at the time. He would now be 16. The detective from Spain tells the Texas cops that this kid claims he was kidnapped by someone in the military and that he was sold into human trafficking. The police officer in Spain tells the Texas cops that this kid says terrible things have been done to him. He's basically been locked in a room for years. He's been abused in every way you can imagine. He said he hadn't seen the sun, he hadn't seen the outside, he was never left alone, but there was a moment where he was able to slip out a door and escape. The boy tells the police in Spain that he didn't even know what city he was in, let alone what country. And so as he ran, he stopped and asked people, where am I? And they informed him that he was in Spain. Nicholas's sister, Carrie, was very involved in trying to find him. So she gets on the phone with the detective from Spain. They're in Linners, Spain. Carrie asked, can I talk to my brother on the phone? The Spanish detective told her, he's not really saying much. Of course, Carrie was overjoyed to hear that her brother had been found and she booked a flight to Spain and flew there to pick up her little brother. People in the area of San Antonio were shocked to hear that Nicholas had been located. They did not expect this. Everyone thought he was gone for good. So Carrie leaves Texas, she flies to Spain and she arrives in Linners. She waited nervously in the lobby of the youth home and then she saw him. They brought him out, this young man, claiming to be her brother. The first thing Carrie noticed was that the young man looked older than 16. She threw her arms around the boy and hugged him very tight. He did not hug her back. The boy did not speak. Carrie pulled out a photo album that she had brought with her and started going through the pictures to show the young man his family and try to get him to remember who he was. Carrie was telling the boy how much he had been missed. They had all been looking for him. Everyone was worried about him. They thought he was dead. They're so happy to see him. Carrie pointed to photos of their aunts and their uncles and their cousins. But the boy sat in silence, not seeming to remember any of the people in the photos. Carrie was bothered by the fact that her brother seemed so distant and didn't seem to remember anyone. But the police told her he's claiming to have been through some horrible things. He's very, very traumatized. So Carrie chalked up the strange behavior to the trauma. It didn't seem far-fetched at all that someone who had been missing for three years and who had supposedly been through so much trauma had been abused would be quiet and reserved and nervous. You would almost expect that. The police, however, were not so convinced. They separated Nicholas and Carrie and talked to both of them. The police took some photos from Carrie and showed them to Nicholas and asked him who the people in the photos were and Nicholas seemed to remember. The police become convinced this is Nicholas Barclay and they issue him a passport, they let him leave with Carrie, they leave Spain and they go back to the US. When Carrie and Nicholas arrive in San Antonio, there is a big celebration. All the family members, the friends, people from the neighborhood are gathered around for this incredible homecoming. But Jason, Nicholas's older brother, had moved away. So he was not at this celebration. Nicholas stayed very guarded. He was very much in his own head. He did not speak. Um, he didn't seem to recognize a lot of the people that were there, but everyone was told, you know, he's been through this terrible trauma. When Nicholas did answer questions, he answered them in short one word sentences and everybody felt this was understandable. Talk of what Nicholas had been through had kind of circulated and people were making all kinds of excuses for him. Well, of course he's acting strange. Of course he looks a little bit different. He looks older. He's been through a lot. Nicholas moved in with his sister Carrie and she decided she was going to kind of take care of him. Carrie was married at this point and she had kids. When Nicholas did begin to speak a little bit more, it became very apparent that he had a very 
thick French accent. Well, Nicholas explained this, saying that whenever he spoke English, he was beaten. He was forced to speak French. And because he'd only spoken French for so many years, he now had an accent. He said he'd been speaking French and French only for so long, he'd almost forgotten all of his English. Then Nicholas tells the family members that he had been experimented on. His captors had done some terrible experiments on him, and one of those experiments involved injecting something into his eyes to turn his eyes from blue to brown. He said his captors that worked in human trafficking were very invested in coming up with methods to change people's looks so they could traffic people more easily. And they were doing these experiments on how to change people's eye color. Not that his family had asked, but they did notice that his eyes that had once been blue were now brown. Nicholas also had bleached blonde hair. He said his captors had bleached his hair blonde. Nicholas had been very blonde when he disappeared, but you know, our hair gets darker as we age, as you can see with my roots. <laughs> Nicholas's eyebrows were really dark and thick. It didn't seem to match the fair haired complexion that he had when he was younger. But again, people change. There was something the family had a hard time getting past and it was the very thick beard. Nicholas would shave in the mornings and by late afternoon, he had a full shadow of very thick black hair. Now for a 16 year old kid that was blonde when he was younger, that seemed odd, but they were just so happy Nicholas was home. That's what they focused on. That's what they thought about. They were just very grateful to have him back. Nicholas began to settle into life in San Antonio. He started school and he even had a crush on a girl. As he's getting settled in, Jason, his older brother, comes to town for a visit. Jason walks into the home and he sees Nicholas and he stops dead in his tracks and he and Nicholas kind of exchange a glance and Jason knows something is wrong. He doesn't really say much, but there is this tension between he and Nicholas. The family could sense this tension, but they didn't really want to know. They didn't want to know why Jason was having a hard time with Nicholas. The family was overlooking a lot of things here, and it's because deep down, they knew. They didn't want to know, but they knew. The boy living with them was not Nicholas Barclay. The boy living with them was not a boy at all. It was almost too bizarre to believe, but the Barclays had moved a total stranger into their home. A few months after Nicholas returned home, the TV show Hard Copy wanted to interview him. Remember Hard Copy? Before the TV crew arrived, the producers of Hard Copy hired a private investigator to look into the story. The private investigator's name is Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker goes to Carrie's house. He knocks on the door. He introduces himself. He says he's been hired by Hard Copy to do some pre-production investigation. Carrie says, I'll go get Nicholas. And Nicholas comes to the door. And Charlie Parker says when Nicholas walked to the door, he could not believe his eyes. Charlie said this obviously was not a 16 year old kid. This was a man who was much older. He had thick black hair and eyebrows, a five o'clock shadow. He had brown eyes instead of blue eyes. And Charlie was immediately like, this is not Nicholas. Charlie noticed something else. He says as a private investigator, you know, he's paid to notice details. Nicholas Barclay had one shape of ear, kind of a more usual shape of ear. And this man had a different shape of ear with kind of a notch in the back. So Charlie leaves the house with more questions than when he arrived. And he almost wondered if this imposter was like a spy of some kind that was sent to spy on the Barclay family. Maybe somebody really did have Nicholas in a human trafficking ring and they sent someone to pretend to be him. Whatever the case was, Charlie was convinced that person living in Carrie's house was not her brother. About this same time, Nicholas's family decided to send him to a psychiatrist. They realized how traumatized he seemed. He didn't seem to be coming out of it like they had hoped. He was still very quiet and very withdrawn and they decided he needed to get some help. Knowing what we know about the family, this is somewhat surprising, but a nice surprise. So Nicholas goes to the psychiatrist and immediately the psychiatrist is red flags all over the place. The psychiatrist knows that being in captivity for three years would not make you forget English and it would not make you speak with only a French accent, even if you spoke French for three years. In fact, it would be just the opposite. 
you would have an American accent while you were speaking French. The psychiatrist was adamant. This is not possible. This is not how language works. This is not how we develop language. We don't completely lose one set of language skills in exchange for another. This is someone that was raised until they were 13 years old in America. They would not forget English. And if they did learn French, they would speak French with an American accent. They would not speak French like a French person. The psychiatrist worked with Nicholas to see if he could speak English without a French accent and Nicholas could not. This psychiatrist alerted the FBI. Now, I know there is a confidentiality issue there, but there are some ways around that. The doctor told the FBI, this is an imposter. This person is pretending to be someone that he is not. So the FBI takes this doctor's claims very seriously and they start to look into Nicholas Barclay, Nicholas Barclay, and they become convinced this is not him. An FBI agent named Nancy Fisher was assigned to the case and very quickly on, she knew this guy was an imposter. Nancy spent quite a bit of time with Nicholas and he went into a lot of detail about what happened to him when he was in captivity. He had places, he had dates, he had times, he had very gory details about what had been done to him. Nancy Fisher came to the conclusion that whoever this person was, they were either someone who had been abused or someone who was like the greatest actor ever. Nicholas told Nancy that he was forced to eat insects, his hands had been broken with a baseball bat, and then of course the experiments that were done to try to change the color of his eyes. Nancy contacted Nicholas's family in private and told them, you are living with a stranger. This is a man, this is not your son. She said, we don't know who he is, but we are convinced this is not Nicholas. The family was not hearing it. They were absolutely convinced this was Nicholas, this was their son, their brother, and they didn't want to hear it. Nancy Fisher asked Nicholas's mother to take a DNA test and she would not. She said, I don't need to be convinced. I don't need a test. I know this is my son. So at this point, the FBI is kind of at an impasse. They're like, well, what are we supposed to do here? The family won't even acknowledge that this isn't their their loved one, and we know that it's not. Well, Charlie Parker, the private investigator hired by Hard Copy, could not let this go. So he started to follow Nicholas around. And one day he was able to pick up an item that Nicholas had been holding, and he got fingerprints off it, and he sent those fingerprints to the FBI. As he was waiting for the fingerprints to come back, he contacted Nicholas and said, I wanna have a meeting with you. Nicholas shows up for this meeting with Charlie Parker, and Charlie starts to tell him, I know you're not Nicholas. To his utter shock, the man says, you're right, I'm not Nicholas. The man admitted to being an imposter. The man is our chameleon, Frederick Borden, who was 24 years old at the time. This was not the first time Frederick Borden had done something like this. Frederick has a long history of using false identities, posing as teenagers, and fraud. In fact, at the time Charlie got Frederick to admit that he was not Nicholas, Frederick was wanted by Interpol. He was wanted for doing something very similar in Europe. Charlie sat shocked to listen that Nicholas Barclay was just the latest in a long line of people that Frederick Borden had impersonated. Charlie contacted Nicholas's family and at first they were very reluctant. They did not want to hear this, any of it. But then their reluctance, you know, kind of turned to resolve and they realized they had been duped. It was starting to sink in. They told Charlie they felt stupid. They were embarrassed that they had believed this. I mean, the signs were there. There was a marked age difference. The guy had different colored eyes. I just think it's sad because they were so desperate to believe that their loved one had returned. They were willing to overlook what was staring them right in the face. Cognitive dissonance is a bitch. I mean, you don't have to tell your ex-Mormon friend that. I watch people do it every day. You can look at proof right in the face and still say, I don't believe it. I think it's sad and I think it's evil. I'm not really a fan of Nicholas's mother or his brother, but I still feel that it's sad for them. I mean, she suffered the heartbreak of losing her son not once, but twice. Charlie continues his conversations with Frederick and then he finds out how Frederick pulled this off. Frederick finds himself in Spain and he's on the streets and he decides it's time for another con. He's out of money, he needs help. 
So he presents at this youth shelter, saying that he does not know who he is. He doesn't have any memory of where he's been. He believes that he has been abused. He thinks he's been held prisoner and the youth shelter takes him in. At night, when the youth shelter closed down and Frederick was supposed to be in bed, this is so wild. He would sneak into the office and use the phone and the fax machine. Frederick would spend his nights at the youth shelter calling police stations all around the area, asking them about missing people. He was trying to retroactively fit his description into a missing person's case. He was trying to find someone that was missing that looked enough like him that he could pull off being that person. So for the first couple of nights, he doesn't have any luck. And then somebody at one of the police station tells him, you'll probably have better luck if you contact NECMEC the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So Frederick calls Nekmek and he poses as a police officer. This guy is really good at impersonating people. He is really a chameleon. He tells the Nekmek representative that he's a police officer that has a boy in custody. Then he describes a 16 year old boy with kind of plain features, goes on and on. And the Nekmek representative says, well, I know there's a 16 year old boy missing from San Antonio, Texas. Frederick, still posing as a cop, asks this NECMEC representative to fax over a photograph of the boy. The representative does this. So now Frederick has a photograph of Nicholas Barclay. It seems so strange that someone being housed in the shelter would have access to the office in the night. <laughs> well, of course, a faxed photograph is going to be in black and white. So Frederick could not see that Nicholas Barclay had blue eyes. When Frederick finally sees a color photo of Nicholas, he comes up with the story of the injections in his eyes to try to change the color of them. So Frederick spills his guts to Charlie Parker and Charlie's talking to the FBI. Frederick is arrested. He's arrested for impersonating a minor, he's arrested for perjury, and he's arrested for illegally obtaining a passport. He was sentenced to six years in prison for these crimes. While Frederick is in prison, he would sit on the phone all day long making hundreds of phone calls about missing people. He would follow the news. He would find out when someone would go missing. He would learn everything he could about the person and about the case. And then he would start hitting up the family. Sometimes he would get people to send him money. Even in prison, Frederick Bourdin was always plotting his next scheme. After Frederick finished his sentence, he was deported back to France. Just three months after returning to France, it's now 2003, Frederick attempted to steal the identity of a 14 year old boy who had gone missing. The boy's name was Leo Bailey and he had gone missing in 1996. So Frederick is still delusional here. Leo would be 21 in 2003. Frederick was closer to 30. Frederick is successful for a little while pretending to be Leo. He's posing as Leo. But then people get suspicious and they demand a DNA test. The DNA results come back. Everybody knows this is not Leo. Frederick does not get any jail time for this. And soon he's back at it again. In August of 2004, Frederick is back in Spain claiming to be a teenager named Ruben Sanchez Espinoza. So this guy is 30 years old at this point in time and he's pretending to be a teenager. I mean, he, he thinks very highly of his looks, doesn't he? I mean, in some ways he's very intelligent. He's pulling off these schemes, but you can't be too smart to think you look like a teenager when you're 30. Ruben Sanchez Espinosa's mother was killed in the Madrid bombings in 2004. If you recall, there was a series of very well-coordinated bombings back then. Well, I guess after these bombings, Ruben had gone missing. So Frederick read about the story and he decided, well, I'm gonna become Ruben. He was found out again and deported back to France again. A year later, the chameleon is back at it. He's passing himself off as 15 year old Francisco Hernandez Fernandez. Francisco was an orphan. Frederick enrolls himself in junior high as Francisco. This is a 30 year old man. He enrolls himself at a junior high called College Jean Monnet in Pau, France. He's telling people that he's an orphan. His parents were killed in a car accident. Frederick dresses as a teenager. He adopts their lingo and their mannerisms. And he's covering his receding hairline with a little cap that he wears all the time. He wouldn't have gotten away with that in America because we don't allow caps here, but I guess in France, you can wear a cap to school. 
He starts using a depilatory cream on his face like Nair, you know, that goes down past the skin level and makes it so your hair doesn't grow in as fast. But it's just wild. A 31-year-old man pretending to be a 15-year-old. This is Peter Pan syndrome on another level, failure to launch on another level. And this is where, like I said in the beginning of the episode, you have to wonder, what is his motive? Is he so terrified of becoming an adult? Is he so scared of failing as an adult or having adult responsibilities, having a job, having a bank account, having bills to pay? Could he really be that terrified of growing up that he's willing to go to these great lengths to become a kid? Or is it something much more sinister? Does he have designs on children? Is he dangerous? Frederick continues attending this junior high until one night one of the administrators at the school is sitting at home watching TV and he sees a documentary with Frederick featured. This administrator realizes, oh my gosh, this guy is pretending to be a student at our school. Frederick is arrested on September 16th, 2005. He gets sentenced to four months in prison. Frederick tells reporters that he did what he did because he's looking for the love and affection he never got as a child. He says that he pretended to be an orphan so that he could feel the love of a mother and father. Now, that's sad if it's true, but it's also very sick. Frederick does some interviews and he speaks very poorly of the Barclay family. He says they were foolish to believe him, that they are a very abusive and combative family. And this is where the very sinister theory arises. Why was Nicholas's family so willing to accept a total stranger that looked nothing like their missing loved one into their home? Well, like I said, because Many people believe either Jason or the mother or both did something to Nicholas. Maybe somebody in that family killed him. So when this imposter appeared pretending to be Nicholas, they embraced him despite the obvious issues because it got them off the hook for making Nicholas disappear. That's a very dark and disturbing theory. To this day, Nicholas Barclay has never been found. We do not know what happened to him. He vanished into the night back in 1994 and no one save his abductor or killer knows what happened to him. On August 8th, 2007, Frederick Bourdain married a French woman. Her name is Isabel, and the two of them had five children together. I feel sorry for the children of someone like Frederick Bourdain, and I hope they're all doing okay. I found Frederick on Facebook. On March 23rd, 2017, Frederick posted that Isabel had left him for another man. He said when she left, she took all the children with her. I find it a little troubling that no one knows where Isabel or the children are. Maybe they don't want to be found. I can completely understand that. But I hope the authorities know where they are. I hope somebody knows where they are. I'm going to show you a little bit of Frederick's Facebook feed. You can see it here. He's now 50 years old and living in Paris. You'd never know by looking at this very normal and usual Facebook page that you're looking at the postings of a monster who has impersonated kids and caused so much pain to so many people. It makes me pause and wonder what kind of people do I have on my Facebook page? At this point, it really wouldn't shock me to find out one of them was a prolific criminal because it's 2024 and you just never know. Thank you for joining me today on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. You can listen to my podcasts. This one is Dining with Death. This is the audio taken from the video episodes posted here on YouTube. This is a current podcast, Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. I post new episodes every Monday and every Wednesday, and there will be some episodes here you cannot see on YouTube. If you want to join my Patreon, that would be amazing. I have people that give a few dollars a month to help keep the videos coming. And you can also be part of our fundraiser. There's a video on my channel. This is the thumbnail. If you click on this, it will take you to the video. It's a short little video. It tells you everything that we are doing to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that's never been tested. We are trying to help solve some cold cases. I want you guys to know how much I appreciate you. I know you have so many options of things to watch. There are so many good creators. There are so many TV shows. And so to know that you spend a little bit of your day with me, it means more to me than I will ever be able to tell you. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Bye.